go. Oh, oh, Roger, you're on. Hello, everyone. <laughs> you are live. <laughs> yeah. get, get off my ear. Get off my ear, Wendy. <laughs> 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 yeah, we had this elaborate, funny start all planned out, and we didn't do it in the end. So there you go. So we're, we're talking about the concept of, um, oh, of animal right. rights in the sense that, um, you know, the Animal Rights Show has really kind of pointed out over the months really now that, you know, our language in the movement is very welfare based and a lot of people will kind of defend that. And so in some ways it creates a question, you know, it, is the lack of animal rights within animal rights, is that something to do with the fact that animal rights itself is too complicated? So um, I wanted to start off by just um, reading out something I prepared only takes two minutes and it's about Tom Reagan's the rights view he calls his position the case for animal rights the rights view and it's got some features uh, to it for example on the direct duties and indirect duties argument Reagan will actually side with the utilitarians against the Kantians although Reagan himself is a Kantian but ultimately he rejects utilitarianism and that's due to its consequentialist nature. Reagan's rights view sees individuals as ends in themselves. They're individuals with rights. The rights view protects individual rights holders by placing a wall or a fence around each and every one of them. So Reagan says that the rights view is cut from Kantian cloth, but with adaptions. So the fundamental principle of Reagan's position, the rights view, is the respect principle. So the fundamental principle is respect principle. It respects individuals, including individuals who are not human. So the rights view does not beg for mercy for other animals. And likewise, it does not ask humanity to be less cruel and it doesn't focus on cruelty to other animals either. So the idea of don't be cruel or stop being cruel is not part of the rights view. The rights view is a demand. It demands that humans respect other animals as the rights bearers and the rights bearing individuals that they already are, according to the argument. The rights view demands the abolition of the human use of other animals. And that includes areas of animal use, which some animal advocates will defend and even promote themselves, such as um, guide dogs for the blind or seeing eye dogs or uh, riding on the backs of horses. The idea of eating eggs from so-called backyard hens and the eating of honey. The rights view rules all, all that out. The rights view does not confuse people by using welfare-based language and cruelty talk. It talks about rights holders, rights bearers, and it talks about its opposition to rights violations. That is the rights view. And as you can see from the language that I've just used, that's not really the language of the movement. And so we're back to the question, is animal rights as an idea, a concept, too complicated? So that's what we're going to be talking about. You've been trying to inject rights into the movement for how many years now, Roger? Well, it's not—it's not me, is it? I mean, you know, I mean, Tom. Tom oh, you Reagan. and others. Yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, Tom, Tom Reagan couldn't do it. Gary Francione couldn't do it. Joan Denea couldn't do it. Um, you know, Gary Francione now runs a counter movement. He's left the movement, and um, he's kind of been marginalized completely by the movement. Tom Reagan was treated absolutely appallingly by the movement. So the person who wrote the case for animal rights was marginalized within the animal rights movement. So, you know, we've got to kind of like come to terms with that reality. It's, a, it's an odd thing to try to analyze, but in, in a way that's our job for the next hour, really. You know, what's going on, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it looks like we have uh, 20, just over 20 people with us at the moment. So feel free to let us know your thoughts um, as we're getting well, into this and we'll welcome everybody. As much as possible. 
Thanks, thanks um, for Seth's tuning in. Here. Je Jennifer's here, <laughs> vegan Potterhead. So, um, yeah, well, I can't, it's been an interesting ride with the show because, like you've said, I mean, this has been a kind of a product of the lockdown. Um, I kind of went into it um, thinking, you know, we could just put these ideas out there and they would just be kind of absorbed. And I think there's been a lot of resistance to that. And I think there's several reasons for that. Um, yeah, and I don't know. I, I initially thought rights would be quite simple, and I think it is at a fundamental level. But I think to be able to argue the case for rights does take studying Reagan's position and others to really kind of back it up. And I'm just curious, is you know, is that something that we can kind of support the movement to do similar to what we've done? Or is there actually alternative language we can use that kind of sends effectively a rights-based message without explicitly mentioning rights? So that, that's kind of the question I'm grappling with at the moment. I know for myself, I'll probably still use rights in the toolbox when I'm talking to people. I just don't know if it'll be the, you know, an essential one I go to every time I ha have a conversation. But I haven't done outreach for a while now because of the lockdown. So it's it's quite theoretical at the moment. Hmm. My understanding well, I mean, I... is that... Sorry, go ahead, Radu. No, no, you, you go ahead. Uh, my understanding, understanding and my experience... Uh, um from um, working with uh, several activist groups in Athens uh, is that most activists accept uh, the existence of inherent rights, they believe in rights, and they advocate for rights. And uh, at, uh, actually, at some point, we, uh, we had um, workshops uh, where the whole uh, point of the conversation of, of, and of uh, taking turns and playing the role of the bystander and the outreacher was to find a way uh, to steer the conversation towards rights and towards the fundamental wrong. And maybe it was not framed frame, um, phrased as the fundamental wrong, but um, we would talk about the moral issue and what is morally wrong and morally right. And uh, my experience from uh, other activists is that uh, every time they have a conversation, uh, they, they try to mention rights. That's their, uh, their aim, their goal and um, most times they succeed. And it's actually here, it's a widespread thing. And it's done even by people that don't know who uh, Trump Reagan is, but uh, they use some of his arguments in their outreach. Uh, the paradox is that uh, many of the same people use also welfareist language. But I think this uh, has a lot to do with uh, the large organizations and the uh, slogans and the um, words they use, and uh, that many activists feel that they have to take these posts or these slogans and, and use them. Um, actually, I have not met uh, a rights, an animal rights activist that does not believe in rights. Hmm. That's, that's my experience from, from the movement. I've, so, I you, so you said well, people uh, use, sorry, just real quickly to clarify, you said people are using Reagan's arguments without yes, knowing Reagan's like work. What, so what? We, we, we've literally been, you know, trying to communicate Reagan's work. So maybe maybe that's a secret. Just don't talk about Reagan and they kind of stumble onto it. I, I'm curious how I, this I happens. I don't know who we have to thank for, for this, uh, let's say, tradition. But yes, they would um, use Reagan's arguments to explain why... Um, other animals have inherent rights and why uh, they should not be ex excluded from uh, the theory of rights. So uh, it's a common thing. And um, I've talked to some uh, friends this week, activist friends, and um, the answer that I got, that I got about the welfare uh, language or the um, very graphic videos <coughs> was that they use it as a Trojan horse to uh, attract the attention of the bystanders and then spin the conversation and talk about rights and about individuals and justice. Hmm. I think that's I, a key I, question right there. If we focus on the individual, can that actually effectively get us to a rights-based position without the philosophical complications and the rest of it? Hmm. I, I, don't, I don't see that. I mean, I've had a different experience in the sense that I've seen conversations, as it were, live and also online, where it's all cruelty-based language. And um, every now and again, you know, a, a kind of rights phrase might be thrown in, but the overwhelming claims-making is based on, on cruelty. 
Now, when, when I've asked people about that, they say things like um, rights are too abstract and that people understand the issue of cruelty. So you would have to explain rights, whereas you're on the same page about cruelty any, anyway, which sociologically I think is not true. I think there's a fundamental difference between what the movement um, thinks they're talking about when they're talking about animal cruelty and its solution, which, which the movement thinks is veganism. For the public, the culture, they're, they're talking about not, not being cruel and yet finding a way to still use other animals. And so they're talking about um, welfare regulations, the way, the way that the politicians would, the way that often the journalists would, and the, uh, you know, and the way that the, the system talks about it. And, and so I think there's a fundamental difference. I think that I, I think that when animal advocates say cruelty, they're saying more than what the culture um, accepts as internalized as that. And on internalization, I do understand from the point of view of um, the animal advocate, they've been socialized into an animal welfare language which is embedded into a movement which calls itself animal rights. So I kind of don't, I don't blame animal advocates for it. It's just that you would have thought that once they progress in the movement and learn more about it, and maybe, you know, Jeremy, we're just not uh, visual in, enough in terms of the animal rights show. You know, maybe that's, uh, that's what the issue is because um, the, the rights message is not getting out there, but it's never got out there apart from one period in the late 1980s and into the 1990s. Yeah, and I think you hit on a key point there. To me, the starting point is the language because I don't think most people in the movement would associate cruelty or suffering with welfarist language or treatment because I, I think it's an interesting thing because I think on the vegan side of the equation, we look at these things and we can't envision a, a form of use that's not cruel or a form of use that doesn't involve suffering or abuse or all these things, but to a non-vegan, you know, the industry is, is pushing these messages out there that there is such a thing. So I think when we say, talk about cruelty, it's almost implying that there's a non-cruel form of use as, is the risk, I think. And I think that's uh, something that non-vegans will, you know, if we give them the chance, they'll grasp onto it. I know I did before I was vegan. You yeah, know, but vegan, vegans, um, argue, vegans argue that, Jeremy, don't they? I mean, they, they, they talk about backyard hens and, and, and these, these issues because they, they themselves have found a non-cruel use and so yeah, they, here, here's, uh, here's one of our first comments actually which ties right into that so it <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind of sums it up yeah i agree <laughs> I, I think as well um what seems to happen as well is everything everything that's um related to issues of other animals all gets put on under the umbrella of animal rights so whether that's welfareism where people are seeking better treatment for other animals or whether it's the as we might say, neo-welfareism, where um, those who say they want rights but pursue it through welfareist campaigns and language, um, because they might see it as welfare plus welfare plus welfare equals rights. Then you've obviously got the another confusion within that of moral rights versus legal rights, because some people, when they're speaking of rights, uh, they talk about giving rights to other animals and changing status uh, through through legal means and through laws. Um, and then, of course, you, you've got the rights-based rights, which is moral or inherent rights that, that we would talk about, the negative rights of not to be bred or killed or used, oppressed, all those things. And then you've even got someone, you mentioned um, Gary Francione earlier, he would talk about the, the, the only right that he really advocates is the right not to be property. Mm. So I think you've got all these kind of confusions within the movement, but it's all under the umbrella of, of rights. And that's just within the movement before we've even taken that to the streets to to the public and people who would have very little to no understanding of, of what rights are. So it's really important, I think, that we we and we have these conversations of how do we cut through all of that confusion to, to actually get to the heart of rights. So yeah, and I yeah, think it's I think it's true. So no, I was just gonna say it's true about the I think the movement has adopted that dominant paradigm from society through its use of language, single issue campaigns, um, in, in the way that it implies distinctions between different uses um rather than all use. So mm. I think well, that's what's going on. I mean it, it's, historically the um I mean it's interesting now, there's a kind of generation gap type thing now, but historically we've always had the confusion 
in the sense that it's always been claimed that um, Peter Singer's animal liberation started the animal rights movement. And of course, he doesn't believe in, in rights. And yet most people who cite and um, use uh, Singer or even sell Singer don't, don't seem to know that. You know, they don't seem to know that in animal liberation, he says he, couldn't, he can't find a problem with free range egg production, for example, right? So we've always had this confusion now, Singer doesn't seem to be cited very much in the movement anymore. And in fact, I would say that a lot of um, modern day advocates wouldn't know who um, Peter Singer is. Used to be the case that they never knew who Reagan was. But they certainly didn't know who Dineo was, but they always knew who Singer was. And now they don't seem to know who Singer is either. And so where, where the, whether it's just some kind of welfare lag into, the, into this generation, I'm not quite sure, but we still got the same confusion, but with a new generation. And it's, I think it's probably because of the fact that th that generation is coming into an already set up um, movement, which is, which is kind of saturated with welfare, uh, you know? And so I think that's the way that um, they think, you know, in, in the sense that I saw a campaign just the other day and the complaint for the campaign was that the, the a farm, that had been investigated had um, the red tractor um, accreditation taken away. And then the complaint from the activists is that the red tractor accreditation has been given back to them. That, that was the complaint. And that was what created a kind of online rally. But from a non rights point of view, it's totally irrelevant whether they've got red tractor or not. Yeah. You know, it's, it's still a rights violation. It's, you know, and yet, and yet we still seem to be very quick to fall into this welfare way of thinking. And um, it, obviously it's frustrating f for me, you know, um, but it still, it still remains that there is that question. Maybe what we want as animal rights advocates is too complicated. It's a sense that you have to learn animal rights, but everybody thinks they know animal cruelty straight away. Maybe, maybe that's where it is. I think part of the the the, you know, the reason that that welfare is kind of still somewhat entrenched is because it it kind of speaks to this idea that um, you know um, that non vegans have been kind of duped in some way in this idea of welfare labels and it's for activists who maybe aren't kind of fully clued up on their right to philosophy it's it's easy for them to point out. Like um, you know that, that that the label of free of free range isn't free range. It's never like it's never what it actually means. And it's 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 I guess they see it as a kind of entry point, and they think that people will go vegan off the back of that. But I, I don't think that the I don't know if people really fully understand the optics or the implication of of these types of messages and how it just perpetuates welfareism and how people will just kind of other non vegans will gravitate towards it because that is that is common thing no one wants to treat animals in a, in, in, in a cruel way whereas the idea of um abolition and and violation of rights are kind of still i guess somewhat avant-garde concepts in in the movement even though they have their own rich history as you talked about you know, with, with with reagan's philosophy and then francione kind of adopting it and then um yeah and that's kind of happened but I do also think that you know it's somewhat regrettable that the, the Francione, Francione's demeanor and the way he's portrayed himself and you know interacted and um, with other with other activists and somewhat isolated himself. It's a shame because his work and his writings do promote the rights based message and some of the, some of the things like I've read, like Rain Without Thunder, in, in the social media posts that he uses. There is a clarity to the language that he uses, which which makes rights kind of, I think, I find easier to understand. I know one of my friends stumbled upon Franz Jones' work and in, in um, some of the outreach that he did, that, he, that he's done, he'll ask questions like, you know, do you think that animals value their lives? Do they matter morally? These kind of questions which touch on rights-based themes, but he, he discovered it through Franz Jones' work. Um, but I do wonder whether his reputation has somewhat, you know, um, <laughs> made it less likely that people will read his work now or kind of view him as a kind of um, respectable person, which is to your point that 
I think you said, Roger, that you know maybe his work will have a greater impact down the line when maybe he's he's no longer involved in the movement as as much as he is now. Um, well, he's not involved in the movement. That's the irony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think? I mean, well, I guess that's the question. Did he take rights with him in a way? You know, do, do people? I don't know for people who are um, studying in the subject. Do they associate him with rights and almost separate from the broader movement and think actually, no. you know, focus? Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, th I think I think that Francione is is a in a similar position to what you just articulated, Jeremy, in the sense that he says now that you can talk about animal rights without talking about animal rights, and you don't have to say anything particularly philosophical. And so I think Francione equals abolition now, not right so you know it would say you know reagan equals rights singer equals the kind of utilitarian version of welfare and francione equals abolition but um you know it's still i mean what, what's it called animal rights the abolitionist approach yeah but, but I, don't, I don't think he talks about rights so much uh, anymore and so maybe maybe he's coming to the same kind of uh, conclusion that, that you have jeremy well yeah and i guess with uh, I can't help but make the language point with abolition. I guess we have to be somewhat mindful of the associations there with human slavery and yeah. not, not to say not to use the word, but just to be prepared to go there and have a response to that if we do. Well, I, I think the thing we've been hitting on here is, you know, how can we send out a clear message if, um, to outside of the movement if we haven't sorted ourselves out inside the movement? Because a key thing I'm noticing is when people hear rights, they think legal rights, and that gets translated to welfare in every sense of the word now. I mean, I don't know of any, you know, <laughs> in the near future, I can't see cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, fishes, and the rest of them um, getting legal personhood and, you know, getting the same protection as humans, for instance. So I think, I don't know, I, I just, yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult to translate that message in a bit. I mean, we do have a number of comments, so we can start diving into those if we want, if, unless anybody else has any opening remarks to add. I mean, I think the, the first one's good for you, Roger. This is your YouTube channel. We pretty much hijacked it. So we, we, <laughs> might, we might as well you, let you take the first easy question. What are your thoughts oh, on okay. Steve Bess? What are your thoughts on Steve, Steve Bess <laughs> um, and specifically intersectionality and relating to other movements, activists, as he describes in his book, The Politics of Total, Total Liberation? You wouldn't know anything about Steve Bess's work, would you? <laughs> I'll hide this in a minute um, so we're not hiding half of our staff here. <laughs> Well, Volunteers, I should say. Staff, <laughs> um, like that. <laughs> no paychecks at the Animal Rights Show, just so we're clear. No Patreons. I, 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 no secret donors. I, Sorry. I, I, I've had a, an in, interesting relationship with, with, with Steve Best in the sense that um, when I was in the Francione camp, so to speak, he, he called me, you know, douchebag and all kind of names. <laughs> it's about every name he, he could think of. But... I mean, he, he came to Dublin. I, I spoke to him at, at Dublin. Interesting. Then he was talking about the rights welfare thing has been a bit of, um, you know, it's a bit of a kind of dead issue. Um, and yet then he started to talk about it m much more himself. And then, you know, his position has always been very sociological. So I've always been very attracted to Steve Best thing because of that. And of course, the thing that I mainly... Um, promote is not the book because it's far too expensive for anybody uh, to buy but um, I think somebody ought to kind of hijack it and just put it out on, on the internet you know against his will I think but um, the there is, there is we can't big... edit this Roger this is live there's no editing know, yeah. <laughs> it's permanently on the internet forever everything you say yeah. whoever, whoever can do that go ahead um, <laughs> yeah. but the, the thing that the thing that I promote is Steve Best's Total Liberation talk from Luxembourg. I think it's 2013. Now, it's interesting now because it is a movement issue in the sense that we talked about the International Animal Rights Conference that takes place in Luxembourg. And for about three years, I think that Steve Best was the keynote speaker. He was very popular with the, um, the activist um, community and, and everything else. And now it's it's kind of like Melanie Joy and Tobias Leonhardt and a lot of other kind of welfareists um, and reducitarians who are now featuring in the, the Animal Rights Conference. So there's, there's been a bit of a shift there. But um, in, in terms of Steve Best's position, 
I think it's very strong. Um, I think he might have the same problem that Tom highlighted with re regard to Francione. He's not got a great personality in terms of a social movement. When you're in a social movement, you do need to compromise a little bit, and you've got to have a bit of diplomacy, says me. And um, but, <laughs> <laughs> you're qualifying but, that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, you know, Francione doesn't have the personality. Steve Best in, in the past has not. I get the impression that Steve Best has kind of mellowed a little bit and probably wouldn't be as bad. Um, then there's also another issue, which is um, his dispute with certain direct a action advocates, which, which we don't need to go into, I, I don't suppose. I don't think that's what the, I don't think, or at least I don't, yeah, I don't think that's what the, the question was, was talking about. So overall, Steve Best's position is, is very strong, analytically is very good. It's kind of prone to sectional, and it's basically saying that we're not strong enough to do it on our own. We can't do what we want to do on our own, and so therefore we need alliance politics. There is an advance on alliance politics, which is an anarchist idea called "We Are Each Other," but that but that's another another question. But that's basically um, talking about alliances and then taking away all the barriers between all the different constituent parts so everybody becomes merged together into one one holistic kind of block which is all kind of pro uh, liberation you know that 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 kind of thing but um yeah so i i hope i i've answered the question i th I, I think i did but uh, <laughs> so so yes thumbs up for steve <laughs> like a thumbs up Sounds yeah, like an endorsement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is he, is he, he quite he, active he these days? He used to be like this. <laughs> <laughs> is, he, is he still quite active? No. Or he kind of, kind of just kind of drifted not, not too much um, recently? Yeah, I do believe he was lined up to do an AR Zone um, uh, interview. Uh, but that, I think, was more than or maybe about a year ago. And I don't think that's materialized. Um, gotcha. So, yeah. So... No, I don't think he's very active. He, uh, his website is still there, but I don't think I don't think it's been updated much. Um, you know, there is still um, Dr. Steve Best kind of website, but um, mm, no, I mean, in in some ways, his perspective would be quite useful uh, now. I would I would say he's kind of mellow. The mellow version of Steve Best is really good. <laughs> I'll leave it, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. that. Steve Best on weed. <laughs> yeah, ch ch the chilled, the chilled best. Yeah. <laughs> they do say that opens the mind, right? Well, the next comment is um, basically just clarifying the that a right is a way of protecting an interest, which is the way I like to think of it. I think that's really helpful when people are just starting to think about rights. I know um, Reagan and as Roger, as you highlight, just kind of almost a. Um, almost like a fence with a no trespassing sign um, around the individual, which is another good way to highlight. <laughs> Does it, is this phone a friend to answer the question? So this is an interesting comment. I think that we could just um, break apart a little bit is um, encouraging people to read the case for animal rights. Um, I know a lot of us on the show are currently reading um, Defending Animal Rights, which I know, Roger, you've kind of suggested as a <laughs> more of an introduction. <laughs> it's like a book club. Yeah, it's like a book club. Yeah. So, yeah, I think... Ch chapter I've, six. <laughs> I've read the case, and I'm now a, the better part of the way through defending. I do think that's a better introduction to his work in a, in a, a, for a variety of reasons. I don't know what everybody else thinks. Um, mm. But you mentioned the, the challenge with... Um, uh, Steve Best's work is the, the access to the books. And I wonder if just books in general, I, I hate to say it, but I think we've got to face the reality. A lot of um, animal advocates don't read these days. And if they do, it's, you know, on social media, very brief things. It's not sitting down and opening up a proper text. So, I mean, part of what we've been doing at the show is trying to get around that, but I'm not sure if that's actually practicable. Mm, to, to, to coin but, a phrase, um, is it... It's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think that um, I mean the, the the worst thing anybody could do is pick up the case for animal rights as the first thing that they do. I mean that 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 would be, as it were, a mistake. It probably always has been. Which although which Roger told me after I read the case. 
yeah, well, you know, I just like to see your su- water front you, you sausage, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pro, but, pro um, cruelty. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah we, we suffered ourselves there, Jeremy. <laughs> Is that what you did too, Tom? Case first? I did, I did yeah. Yeah, me. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> We're horrible role models. <laughs> But, but it's almost but, like if you if you can get through that one, then the next one's a breeze. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, it is the more question, comprehensive. The question, the question to 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 ask um, you four who've read read this n- new as it were recently is um, is it sufficiently? I mean, it's a lot more accessible than the case. That's that's a given. But is it is it still too complicated anyway? And it would kind of need, need something like the I'm Right show. To kind of try and break it down into more kind of user-friendly, bite-sized, you know, kind of uh, this this is the kind of um, soundbite generation type issue. And of course, philosophy doesn't really go with that too well. And that's maybe one of the problems. You know, pe- people don't think of animal welfare as a philosophy. They see animal rights as a philosophy. So, you know, that's one of the. Hmm. So, I mean, what do you think? Do you, do you think? Even, even even defending is a bit too much, do you think? In places, it's still quite deep. Like you were saying, the um, putting people in their place, that one's quite deeply philosophical. I think I think it is good for for us to have these discussions and, and put it into, I think, more practical terms. That would be a thing that sometimes you... I find myself wishing that there was a practical example of like, oh, what does he mean in this uh, situation? Could he further that and give me an example of where that plays out in reality, I guess? That's sometimes what what I would find useful. Well, I guess in philosophical texts, it doesn't always go that way. We stay in the the heady <laughs> realms of, of, you know, thinking and philosophy. So I think that would be useful. And I guess, and I guess that's where we can have discussions between us and other activists about that. I actually think that um, well, um, Francione's book, Rain Without Thunder, he does a really good job of summarizing um, the rights-based approach in comparison to the kind of utilitarian welfare-based approach. I, to be honest, I actually found, I would actually say that I found that chapter e- just easier to read and understand than um, probably some of the some of the chapters in um, that Reagan's written in Defending Animals, Defending Animal Rights, and the case Animal Rights, but... It's just different, yeah. It's just different writing writing styles. But I I do hear you that like Wendy that um, some examples um, would it be perhaps make it a bit easier as well. Well, yeah, I think like well, we're, we we're, made we're it. part of the YouTube generation, aren't we? I mean, I know the way I started out was I watched YouTube videos, and you, you almost kind of imitate others. And I think that we become kind of carbon copies of what we've seen on YouTube in that way, and we don't necessarily challenge ourselves to form our own structure. We kind of you know, do that mimicking. So, yeah. And, and there's, well, we're on, really... we're on YouTube now, aren't we, Jeremy? I, mean, we're <laughs> I on shouldn't YouTube, talk it down but... too much. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not mean tonight. that. But I mean, that, the, the thing is, you know, um, somebody giving, a, as it were, a lecture on, on, on Reagan's philosophy would just be as, as boring as writing, reading a book, probably from, from that point of view. Um, but, I mean, we did joke about... Uh, a book club before. I mean, maybe uh, this is a forum where we could go through Reagan's work kind of idea by idea or chapter by chapter and just, you know, kind of outline. You could almost have a, like a, um, a PowerPoint outline what the basic idea of, of, of each chapter is. And then mm-hmm. and then we can talk about it. Maybe mm-hmm. that would um, help people read it, you know, because obviously there's nothing that could really replace that as the best you know, the ideal type. But if we could help people read um, the book, then we, we would have done a good job then, wouldn't we? I think, I think that was a key point, you... though, the, the practical. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Wendy. No, so go ahead, Nella. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, I believe that... Uh, Eeny, meeny, be, uh, <laughs> quite useful. Uh, for uh, another reason, also, there is a barrier of language for many people. And although the, uh, most are able to watch a video and have no problem with understanding the, the English language, uh, mm. it's not the same thing reading a philosophical text. So uh, unpacking some of that uh, chapter by chapter uh, would be very helpful for, for, uh, for many people, I think. 
yeah and, and as we said earlier books can be quite expensive as well so sometimes yeah. it can be it That's can true. be a, fi a financial restriction but i was i was just thinking it's quite um interesting because i think people are absorbed and socialized into their into their environments and if you go back sort of um back to the 80s and 90s you would have had a lot more e-zines and people would have been trying to read things and magazines and and books whereas now like uh, Roger you alluded to earlier that people are very much in the the first thing they're they're going to is YouTube and watching the you know, YouTubers and that language and and kind of mimicking like you were saying uh Jeremy as well mimicking the the kind of styles or the yeah the language or using the footage or whatever it might be or coming into someone like uh, AV and that's the kind of exposure so I, th I think people are obviously a a product of the exposure that they they arrive into in the movement so it, and i think books are just not that sexy anymore are they <laughs> in this day and age i think people just don't naturally go for books so much so i think anything we can do to to make that more accessible in this you know in this uh, kind of social media culture would be helpful for sure it's kind of, it's kind of like starting over isn't it um, I mean, I'm tempted to say yes, otherwise we're all out of a, a job. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 I mean, I think let's, just let's going through more of the comments, I mean, here, this is something we often talk about um, on the show is that people refer to animal rights more just in the name, but what is actually meant mm. to that? And then if, we, mm. if rights do come up, then it gets translated down to those other things we've already covered, you know, legal rights and welfare and the rest of it. Um, Ronnie's made a language yeah, point, I mean, maybe I, we can I, unpack a little bit. Go ahead, Roger. Can we can we go back? To, can we go back to the other one? Just just, oh, just since you asked nicely. <laughs> yeah, thank 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 you thank thank you, uh, Jeremy. Um, oh, well, Ronnie was getting all I excited. Mean, I, I then. Tend, <laughs> yeah, I tend, was I very tend, patient I tend, to, to get to the comments. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've only got twenty minutes, so I'll just keep talking so Ronnie doesn't get on. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I I tend <laughs> I tend to, I tend to agree with this in the sense that. Um, you know, animal rights has been used rhetorically, and that's Francione's one of Francione's main points is the fact we use it as a label, and 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 that's all. And and like now, you know, there is there are certain people now who, um, amidst all the cruelty talk, they kind of throw in the word violate now and again, as though that translates it to animal rights, and that doesn't do that either. So I I kind of tend to agree with this actually. Mm. And back to the earlier point, even if someone refers to rights violations, unless they've internalized the philosophy and are prepared to defend it, I'm just not sure even just sprinkling rights violations in there necessarily plugs the hole. I think we've got to, whatever whatever language we go with, and it's a very personal thing. I think what language we choose to use is a very personal topic, and we have all you know go about it in our different ways. But I think we've got to be prepared to to stand behind our words. So yeah, yeah it's not uh, no no quick fixes. I don't think. I, I partially agree with that statement. I actually believe that most vegans don't understand uh, animal rights, but I feel that most activists understand animal rights. That's the dis distinction I make. Mm, interesting. Mm. I think even people who are not... Right. Sorry, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> make them oh, wait. No. Make them wait. <laughs> I think even even people who admit that they're not an animal rights advocate, for example, Peter Singer, though they still didn't didn't he say something like, "Oh, I've just I've just given up correcting people now," and he just will allow himself to be called an animal rights advocate, even though he's totally not. No, and, and no would, and would, not all, not not always. I mean, there there is a, a modern day video where where he he stops the interview right at the beginning and says, "Just just I just want to make a pedantic point." And, and another complication, of course, is that utilitarians will talk about legal rights until the cows come home, <laughs> vegan phrase. Um, and and so uh, so there is that complication. Yeah, I mean, anim Animal Liberation, the book, starts off talking about women's rights. So and, and, unless you've got some level of knowledge, uh, let's say, you probably need some help in unpacking all that. You know, I mean, like there's... um. There's a, fa there's a famous kind of sentence from Singer where he says, um, you know, if if humans have rights, then other animals certainly do. That, that, that's me paraphrasing. But most people then think, ah, you know, animal rights. But the, the, the operative word was the beginning of the sentence, if. 
you know, because he's saying if humans have rights, which he doesn't believe, then other animals do. But he, but he's his position is that other animals and humans don't don't have moral rights. And he would certainly say that moral rights and the rights uh, position Reagan is not the best way to found the claims making of a social movement. That's what that's the fundamental disagreement between Reagan and Singer. Really, is the fact that Reagan. I mean, if you if you read Reagan looking back at the case, Reagan thought that he'd started the animal rights movement. And in fact, there is an interesting audio which includes Gary Francione and Anna Charlton and Bob Linden of Go Vegan Radio. And they, they talk about Reagan shortly after um, Reagan died. And they did really th think for a, for a brief moment, there seemed to be a possibility that the animal rights movement had been born because of Reagan. And that's what uh, Reagan thought he'd done. And he could tell he's, he's almost tearfully writing later. I, I, I completely failed. You know, I, I, I wasn't able to do it. I wasn't able to persuade the animal rights movement to be an animal rights movement. I mean, it's, it, it's quite a sad story in a way. Well, to build off your point, if, you know, Peter Singer can't be the only one that rejects rights for both humans and other animals. I mean, I, back to our earlier point, I mean, is that not a, a case to be focusing on the individuality of other animals as a, a case to them not being, you know, used in all the, you know, other forms of rights violations that, you know, obviously depends how we frame it. But, you know, is, is that actually a, a case to that we could be alienating part of our audience if we are focusing on on rights? Does that question make sense? Say that again, but definitely. My answer. <laughs> no, no, my, my, my answer to that has always been that there are some people who want to base the animal rights movement on animal rights. I mean, I, 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 I always struggle because it's kind of like almost comical to, to have to say this, that there are some people in the animal rights movement that want to actually make animal rights a central part of the animal rights movement. And so in some senses, everybody else who nevertheless still use the name are kind of getting in the way of that endeavor. And so, in a sense, you could you could say that the media, the politicians, and the public in general um, have never really had the chance to assess the claim that other animals are rights bearers and that to use them are rights violations, because it's all mixed up in this welfare stuff. And and so the kind of pristine animal rights case has never really been made to them. And so I've always thought, well, look, if you don't believe in, in, in rights and you reject them for whatever reason, then don't call yourself animal rights. So, so that means that the people who do want to base the movement on rights could, as it were, have the name animal rights. Again, it's almost comical to have to try and appeal to people and kind of go, excuse me, welfareists, can we have our name back? I mean, but that's essentially what we're dealing with here. It's a similar thing with veganism, though, isn't it? Because with vegan, you've not veganism is a philosophy against all oppression, and it's ethical by default. But now it's almost like you have to say, "Oh, I'm an ethical vegan," <laughs> as yeah. opposed to anything else. And then you know, because it's been diluted in so many ways, like you've got um, you know people not considering the scope of veganism to be against all oppression. It's now seen often by a lot of people as a diet, which is obviously not because it's plant, we, we should say plant-based. And then sometimes, like if you're looking at products, vegan, um, you kind of, it, it means containing no products that are stolen from other animals, but it doesn't mean vegan in its essence because it might still be tested on animals. Whereas uh, cruelty-free, you would think would also mean vegan, but it doesn't. So cruelty-free just means that no. it hasn't been tested other animals so they're not actually synonymous and so you've got all this dilution of veganism as well with the whole in a similar way in that you almost want to reclaim the word vegan because it's just been so diluted i wonder if there's an element of kind of clickbait kind of going on you know just the idea that people have an idea be it a, a variety of ideas of what animal rights is so just use that label get get their attention and then we'll kind of talk about our version our diluted version same with veganism and you know you see this online a lot with even some videos and and 
just the media generally. And I wonder if, if some of that is kind of rubbed off on people in our movement, where they just just they don't care if the title of what they're kind of espousing matches with matches with the rhetoric or there's a mismatch of values, and, or they I don't know. I, I see people using the using the word welfare now, Tom, quite a lot. Even yeah. polls, you know, why why did you become vegan? You know, health, environment, animal welfare. You know, there's there's no animal rights in 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 the uh, poll. You know, mm. that's yeah, one for Jeremy probably... to start out. I think. <laughs> <laughs> got on those yeah. polls, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, actually, StreamYard doesn't do the polls. We used to do lots of polls on the Zoom calls, didn't we? I think that's a tricky one. And that's no, you did, you did, Jeremy. First... You did, Jeremy. You did, Jeremy. You did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that's something that came up in our first no. um, first uh, discussion, didn't it, Roger? The the whole almost this gatekeeping of who can call themselves rights. And I think it's a really difficult balance because you don't want to just say everything is rights because obviously to the point, you know, that dilutes it. But if, if I think to me, the, 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 the standard should be if people are open to learning and, you know, grounding, you know, their advocacy and rights, because if we restrict I, rights I think it's everyone a who studied thing. Reagan, I mean, we'll, we'll be able to, you know, have a small party, but I'm not sure we'll have a movement out of it. You know, how many people have studied Reagan? No, I, I mean, I think I, that's... I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I think it's a horrible thing, actually, because um, this thing about you're not vegan, you know, you're not rights, you know, you're not, you're not this. It, it, this is a horrible thing to do within a movement, but it, it happens all the time in all movements, and it, and also political parties. You know, you know, you're not a socialist, not all, all that. You know, you're not a real conservative, whatever, right? Um, at the same time, not everything can count as X. So if there's something like animal rights, not every but as Wendy said, it's almost as though we've got a movement now where everything just gets thrown into this box marked animal rights. And it's, you know, it's a bit of a muddle. And so, you know, you're looking through the box, uh, you know, and you're having to pick out the little bits that are actually animal rights. But then it's difficult to argue that when, when there's other people who claim that everything in that box is animal rights. You know, like, what, what difference does it make? It's all to do with the well-being of other animals. And so for some people, rights and welfare will intermingle and go together and stuff. And so it's not really a, 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 an issue. You know, single issues and, and abolitionism can, can blend together. That, that's not, not an issue. There's, a lot, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of interesting arguments to it. And it is very uncomfortable to start saying to somebody else, well, actually, you're not getting it, mate, type of thing. You know? Probably want to say speaking of not getting it, mate, it, it, it's time for Rummy, I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, real quickly, because he was he was brought up oh. and also talking about the idea. Um, Seb's made an interesting point um, that, and this isn't somebody saying he's not vegan. This is literally um, Peter Singer himself identifies as a flexible vegan, which I think to me underscores why that philosophy isn't really consistent with you know even if cutting out rights and the deeper philosophies. I mean, just veganism, which I think most people can get their heads around. He doesn't, you know, Singer doesn't identify with that. So why would we ground our positions on his? Um, but yeah, it is wrong. It is time for Ronnie. Well, you know, oh, <laughs> going back to the earlier <laughs> you get you get two more readers, and then that's it. I'm cutting you off. All right. <laughs> I, I was actually only joking, but on this point, right? <laughs> um, it, it's quite interesting because I mean, the, the doesn't argument, sound like you're joking. Is, <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> Ronnie would be tearing his hair out if he had any. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> most people um, don't don't know that Peter Singer isn't vegan, but people like the vegan strategist Tobias Leonard would uh, would argue that not being vegan is the is the quickest way to get a vegan world, and so we need to lower the bar to make the vegan movement as big as possible, and essentially. He thinks that we should redefine veganism to mean vegetarianism, and therefore there'll be as many vegans as there are vegetarians, and then you'll have a bigger movement. And then presumably the idea is that once we've suckered everybody into this veganism, which is not really veganism idea, then you tell them at some point in the future what veganism really is. I suppose that's the, 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 the plan. So, you know, there's, there's always a lot of people who would argue that, you know, veganism is still a bit of a scare word, and the best thing to do is be a flexible vegan, or a flexitarian, or a reducitarian, 
because you're not going to scare people away. I mean, you know, that that's the answer to, to that to that argument. We, we're more we're more purist about it. We think that telling the truth has got value mm. and that being consistent morally has got value. And so having a consistent moral message is 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 the thing that we we value very much as individuals and we think that's the best way to advocate i mean, I mean if if there's people who are veganish that's fine that's veganish it's not vegan that's good yeah i think that the problem yes, with that with that i was going to say is just you, yeah you kind of lose like the core ethic of what animal rights is about you know like um justice respect respect for all um through that kind of approach of Okay, you know, we're welcoming everyone. We're welcoming all these different approaches that kind of some may be vegan, some may be vegetarian. It's you know, we're ending suffering, all this kind of stuff. Um, I think that the one of the reasons that that you know Singer may be sort of revered in his work is, I guess, at the time when he wrote Animal Liberation, he was talking about things like speciesism, which was, I guess, a fairly new concept, and no, one, maybe no one had written about that, and there wasn't maybe speak, speak on that. So he he did give reasons arguments for people to go vegan at that time but then it's obviously it's he never fully embraced rights and talks about you know eating <laughs> eggs from happy chickens and the, the ethic and gets lost and it becomes more of this um a virtuous kind of a virtuous way of being rather than just a um kind of yeah baseline principles and um, that's that's the danger i guess that which we're, we're, see, we're seeing the effect of that in our in our movement. Mm. Even advocates for humane slaughter, doesn't Singer, which mm. baffles the mind. Yeah. But I, I think we should well, go one, around. One, one, advan awfully, one advantage one more of animal liberation is it's a lot, it's a lot easier Hang to, on, uh, Ronnie. to read. <laughs> Come on, Ronnie. Ronnie, Ronnie. Let's have Ronnie. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I believe that Ronnie's statement is absolutely true. There is a lot of abuse that is not connected to use, a lot of oppression that has nothing to do with use. So I think that uh, the word use does not cover everything. Talking about the climate yeah. crisis. And yeah, we did, uh, for those who haven't seen it, we did a couple of videos around the definitions, particularly in the second one. We really got into the language. I know for myself, I focus on the four key ones bread, use um displaced or killed um i think to me that encompasses most of it you know climate crisis i think both displacement and being killed and um I, the, the, the displacement side of it was thanks to your inspiration ronnie so thanks for that because i do think it's good to be very objective in what we're talking about otherwise people are left saying well what about humane slaughter and some of these things we were just discussing well we've got another uh question hmm. here is do you think rights well, and welfare concepts Well, going back to Ronnie, are Ronnie's question. <laughs> <laughs> Burning through all your all your uh, extra chances. Do you think rights and welfare <laughs> concepts are linked in terms of the concept that rights are there and have to be recognized as an aid to welfare? And I think this touches on a point that I've been grappling with recently because even welfare reform is technically implemented through legal rights which is, in, in effect, grounded in moral rights. And I know part of the Animal Rights Show is um, aiming towards simplifying things, which I realize that statement is not exactly doing. <laughs> but I think it's just important for us to tether. I, I've started tethering my positions and my framing more towards treatment versus use. And I'm not sure if rights is necessarily doing that. If we're in a welfarist movement, if pe people start talking about rights, I think as we mentioned earlier, I think they're just going to translate it down to welfare until they've, you know, really internalized it. And yeah, the crowd I mean, is speechless. I think. Could you I see think that I question again, Jeremy? Could you put that question? Vegan sure. Yeah. Question back up again. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. If you had. I, mean, I was just going to say that. Yeah. If you look at some of the legislation. You know, for example, um, in the UK, you know, animals who are farmed, so the legislation, it'll be like, you know, animals, um, animals who are farmed have to have a level of um, stimulation to kind of keep them, keep them psychologically healthy in that, in that sense. And that, that is kind of a recognition of a, <clears throat> of a, of a right per se, I guess, but it's always framed in this idea that it's, it's, it's cocooned in this idea that the, 
animals are property of another of a person. So it's 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 not the full. It's like impoverished an impoverished <laughs> little right, I guess, in that sense. Which um, does that make sense? Does that make well, sense? It's, it's it, it's it's the right to welfare while being used. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And a lot of the biggest so, advocates now for for pro. Oh, sorry, Roger. I thought you you paused so long that I thought you no, finished. I, I, <laughs> you oh, got yeah, a tough one there. <laughs> <laughs> Still a stage. <laughs> a lot of the the biggest pro welfare um, uh, kind of bodies now as well are actually in the industries that are profiting the most from the use of other animals as well, because they are obviously uh, trying to, you know, bring uh, welfare in the laboratories, you know, make, make the other animals more comfortable or, you know, or bigger cages and, or a, a different way of stunning before slaughter, all those kind of things. These are people actually in these industries who are trying to advocate for much higher welfare, but they will never, it's in their it's in their interest never to advocate for the end of the use of the other animals so it's it, it almost feels like the two can they are linked in a way but they're they're always going in opposite directions in a way i feel it, as well. it, it i think it takes us into a difficult place uh, uh excuse me i'm getting blasted by the sun so uh but um it's like yeah, an I, I, was, into a difficult place. I, I was gonna say what well, Whatever you do, Roger, don't go into the light. Don't go into the light. No, 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 no. I feel, feel like Dracula, Dracula or something. <laughs> but um, we're 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 at a, a difficult place when you talk about rights to welfare, in the sense that um, I remember a TV interview that Earthling Ed did, and I was quite disappointed in the sense that they were talking about um, uh, about being a butcher at one point, and then the butcher mentioned the fact that. Um, they also owned an abattoir, and in the abattoir, everything was fine, and the other animals was, were stunned before they were killed. And Earthling Ed said, yeah, but the stunning doesn't work all the time. And the other guy said, yes, it does. And Earthling said, no, no, it doesn't. And it, and it, and it, it went back, backward and forward. So would, would a right to welfare be that it would be guaranteed that the other animals would be properly stunned before they're killed? It doesn't seem too much of a right. You know, and and so you know, to actually get, to actually get kind of embroiled in those ideas, I think kind of increases the confusion, if if that makes sense, because it certainly would would mean then that you start to argue, for, you know, we we need this reform or we need this law. I mean, like, again, going back to the red tractor thing, lo lots of advocates start to talk about high welfare and red tractor um, problems that you know that this farm. Is not lived up to the red tractor label. So what? It, 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 it's irrelevant from an animal rights point, point of view. You know, wh whether, whether they've got the accreditation or not is it, irrelevant. I mean, you always know that you can go into any farm along the street and you'll find rights violations. Isn't, isn't that all we need to know? And so I think it takes us into muddy, it muddies the water, I think. Yeah, and, and I think we're still out there in my the movement, dark land. <laughs> <laughs> we're still here. We're still here. <laughs> it does. Follow our voice. Uh, I feel that most <laughs> activists in the street would not give uh, uh, that kind of, of, of answer about uh, other animals being successfully stunned or not. They would turn the conversation towards the fact that uh, there is no humane way to kill a sentient being someone who wants to live. That's what I hear from the activists in the street. They would not get in details about a successful or an unsuccessful stunning or other welfareist reforms. So yeah, the thing it, is though, there's no humane way to kill that's someone echoed who by this want point, to die. Just real quickly. That's, yeah. that, that's what most activists would say in the street. And that's what they hear. Yeah, and we, we know YouTubers. We don't know, you know, philosophers that wrote the case for animal rights in the 1980s. Unfortunately, that's just the, the reality of the movement. And I, mm. I think, you know, a follow on from that appointment is that the focus on welfare is, I mean, I don't think it's intentional, to be fair. I think it's unintentional, but it is there, you know, that well, they've, they've, been, they've been social. I mean, I mean, these these guys are not being vegan for very long. I mean, you know, I mean, um, pe um, it was a couple of months ago when I think Carbstrong was 
celebrating the fact the fact he's been vegan for six years and everybody's going, no, nobody can be vegan for six years kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, Earthling Ed has been vegan still for less than five, I think, so coming up to five. So, you know, these people have not been vegan very long and they've been they've been socialized by the existing movement, which is wel welfare-based. Going, going back to what Nella said, I see that claim a lot. There's no way to kill someone who doesn't want to die. There's no humane way to kill someone who doesn't want to die. But what if there was? It wouldn't make any difference either, would it, for, from our point of view? It'd still be wrong. It'd still be a rights violation. Mm -hmm. if, if, if there was a slaughterhouse in which the, it, was, it was humane by a, a reasonable definition of what that meant, you know, a, a completely painless death, you know, Temple Grandin, you know, winding things so the other animals are less aware of what's going on and all the rest of it. The, the most perfect slaughterhouse from, uh, from the point of view of humane would satisfy welfareists but would not satisfy rightists. That's a fundamental difference, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that's I why we've got, got to set that clear end goal, yeah. But I think the way they, they mean it is that uh, it's unfair kill somebody um, any way you use. I mean, uh, you cannot um, violate the right to life. That was the basic um, argument um, most activists use. I mean, you, that you violate, the, uh, by, by killing someone, you violate their uh, right to life. So I think It's that, not, uh, not the same yeah. argument, Nella, is it? If, if, if you're saying, do not violate rights, that's one thing. If you're saying there's no way to humanely kill, that, that's not the same argument at all, is it? No, it, it, it's not. I, I think it's a way to make the, the person that you have the conversation with to, um, to stop thinking about uh, welfareism and uh, reforms and more humane uh, ways to kill someone. It's like at the beginning the, of the, the, the way that, the way that mm, the, the way that I would think about that is that a lot of people would go, okay, well, let's make it humane then. Be because mm -hmm. they're they're brought into a culture in which, you know, humane use is the promise. And so if if humane killing is not happening somewhere, then something's gone wrong with the system in, that they've got in their mind. And so th their solution would not be go vegan or abolish animal use or anything anything in the kind of uh, right space. It would be we need, we need to regulate the shit out of this to, to, to get it back onto track again. So something's way. gone wrong with the with the regulation. I was just you should say, be in politics, Roger. Regulate the shit out of it. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> technical term. <laughs> when I hear um, the word humane described, I often hear activists describe, you know, the meaning of the word, compassion and care, and of, of, of just to kind of contrast that with kill, the, kill, the act of killing itself and to show that mm -hmm. all killing is wrong. I mean, it could, obviously, when you're talking about humane other situations in which you know there's an animal who who's very poorly and unwell it could be in their interests to be, be euthanized and put down i don't know if that's technically that is still killing but it's it's with a thought for their own well, um their life the, 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 the question that then is why is killing wrong mm. and um oh, oh the, the the kind of thing about oh the stunning thing doesn't work is oh well it, you know it hurts them or it's painful or it's you know it's it's a horror thing to, to go through. Yeah. If the stunning was work working, they'd be totally unconscious, and they 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 wouldn't know anything about it. So why is that wrong? Yeah. What what, what do they what do they say to that? Mm. And I think well, that's the that, trouble. And let I mean we we say it's wrong because it violates rights, but what do they yeah. say? And that's the trouble if we if there isn't um if there aren't people out there putting the right space view forward that is never on the table because yeah. people are always going to be in that welfare paradigm that conversation about welfare and if you take it to its nth degree and we did have these amazing slaughterhouses where you know every other animal was just given an injection and then killed most of the pe population would be totally on board with that. And, th and that's where there's a disconnect. It's like we, we're giving out mixed messages. We're saying, we want you to be against cruelty and we want you to make a change because you're against cruelty. And people are saying, ah, yes, I'm, I'm already against cruelty. 
I'm but, against but then there's a big, everybody's I'm against, against cruelty. cruelty. Yeah. yeah. So they don't they don't see the connection. It, they don't join the dots of making that change because they already feel that they're on board in the same in the same mindset. But it's, it's, so it's one of, it's on one of the core. Team. We think we're agreeing with each other and we're not. Yeah. yeah. yeah we're past each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's total it's, disconnect. It's, it's one it's of the. the yeah. It, it is one of the core teachings of of species society. They you, we tell our kids not to be cruel to other animals. And you know that's one thing that that is that is you know generationally we say that, but that doesn't mean you can't eat them and kill them and stuff, Be, because well, and, you know it's not it's not. I, I think, and to make a bit of a pedantic point, but I think it's a necessary one. I think when we get into these rights based conversations, if we're not prepared for where they might go. I think we can expose ourselves to certain discussions and doors being open that we don't want to open. I think right to life, for instance, has a bit of a hole in it because we actually, these anim the, our fellow animals that we're focusing on shouldn't be bred in the first place. So it's not a matter of them having right to life. It's a matter of them not being bred, which to me is about respect. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and this is, you know, if we, people want to study Reagan, they want to talk about rights, they feel confident about that. I say they do it. But from my perspective, like, let's talk about individuals and let's talk about respect because you don't breed someone into existence for net negative life. And then it doesn't matter what happens once they're there. It all flows from that fundamental wrong. So if we're going to tether everything to this right to life, unless we're talking about free living beings. Um, and some people would I'm, actually say... I'm about to say, get fired up here, so somebody jump yeah. in. <laughs> so Some people would actually say by, bre by breeding other animals, you're giving them life. I had a conversation with someone who breeds dogs the other day, and his mindset was totally, oh, I, I am giving these dogs life where there wouldn't be life, and there needs to be breeders, otherwise we wouldn't have any dogs. And it was like... Yeah. breathe breathe <laughs> okay but but some people would have that that view that they are giving life so <laughs> this may be a bit of i've heard this comparison being made and it's it's um i can't i think i might have read it i can't remember who, who i wrote it um, who, who wrote it but it was a comparison of um human context actually and it was you know if you you were bringing in a child into the world and you you knew that they were going to be exploited you knew that they were going to be abused it was a given um you know you wouldn't you wouldn't do it um i know that that's it's a bit more of um there could be other complexities going on with that but it, it is when we you know, when those animals are bred into existence they're being it's it, it's perpetuating the property paradigm it's basically saying it's okay because they're going to they're going to be owned and, and this forth, and it's not that it doesn't solve the um the primary goal which is to kind of give animals their own autonomy and, and freedom and and um the rights that they could have yeah it's one of the complicating factors about animal rights theory when people learn that there wouldn't be as many other animals in an animal rights world than than there are now although that's not entirely true it means that um there would be less domesticated other animals yeah. but there would be more free living beings so there'd, there'd be a kind of switch uh, in that sense so There'd probably be um, actually an abundance of other animals. In fact, something that David Attenborough talked about, funny enough, um, in his Netflix thing, which is obviously is not a vegan thing, but he talks about how we need to rewild, um, you know, the wild areas and this kind of stuff. And um, there would in a vegan world because we we would be able to give give back so much land mm. to free living beings. It's just that we 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 would, we would have to cut down. Well, we'd have to end the the dom domesticated other animals that that we breed. That bit would end, and through that process, we would then create a lot more space for free living beings. But it, it is an an initial kind of um, difficulty for people to think you, you're actually kind of like again springing them into. You know, you want to make them extinct. That's they often put it that way, and and of course, in some senses, that's true. But it's it, it's not easy to argue it. I suppose. And that's it. I think we've got to be prepared to defend our position, whatever that may be. I've seen, I'm just going through the comments here. It's a fantastic conversation um, happening in the, the, the thread there too. I, I've had a quick skim. I think I've gotten to all the, um, the key questions. So if we haven't gotten to your specific comment, um, maybe we can loop those in next time. But we've hit the hour mark and we originally pegged for an hour. So we're trying to be time centric here. So 
any closing thoughts? Well, how to, this is your channel, Roger. Should, do, you, do you want to choose how we wrap this thing up? Do you have any uh, cheeky outro you usually add on your videos, or how do we do this? <laughs> no, I, I got a serious one, which is that um, there's no way there's no way that we can tackle this issue in in an hour. But we just wanted to again kind of put it on the table, um, almost. And um, again, it's just I don't know. I, I um, my situation is that I would like to give rights based animal rights a go a try within the the public arena and present that to to journalists and present that to to the movement and present that to the public if you like uh, but the, there's a block to it the, the animal rights movement is a block to animal rights uh, as we as we five see it and and i i think that we kind of almost like need to clear away because I, 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 I would like, and I, I want, wanted this for more than 30 years, I would just like to see how it plays out. You know, is, is the animal rights position, you know, would it work? Is it, is it going to be feasible? Is it going to be um, com completely rejected? Or is it going to be embraced once people understand what the animal rights position actually is? Because I think it's a stronger position. I think it's mm. the strongest position that there is. It, it means that we're honest with people, we're very straightforward, and we've got a reason for all that. Other animals uh, are rights bearers, and that to use them and to exploit them, to oppress them, that's a rights violation. I, I, mean, I think that's a kind of beautiful message. It, it, it never gets out there. It's not the message of the animal rights movement, which, which is almost weird, and it's been weird to me for more than 30 years, that the animal rights movement does not talk about animal rights much. And uh, in my PhD, I use this phrase, that there's a book called There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack. And I use the phrase, there ain't, there ain't no rights in the animal rights movement. And, and it's almost like, a, you know, how the hell did that happen? That, 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 that's where I am. Mm. Now, how is the animal rights movement devoid of animal rights? It's, it's weird to me. That's my Maybe that's a statement. question we can address in our next show. <laughs> that, that's my that's my jokey way of fi finishing there, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> very jokey. <laughs> well, my defense is I wasn't here, so this movement was mucked up when I got into it. So I'm not taking any, any fault for it. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's it's, it's Ronnie it's Ronnie Lee's fault, everybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, Roger, you were there too, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right well with that um please do follow us on facebook and instagram we're playing around with different um platforms this is our first one on youtube which i think has actually gone quite well i think it's better suited to these long form discussions so um we do appreciate that feedback i think we'll still work in the zoom calls occasionally but just that, on a i think on, no on a technical point to uh, jeremy that is your la thing. that's your last let, that's yeah, your this last, is last uh, let's go back <laughs> <laughs> are, 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 pe are people able to, I mean, are we able to I'm carry sorry. on the conversation in the comments? Yeah? Sorry, I was mucking around. I completely missed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there I am, ask, asking a serious question, and what happened? <laughs> so, um... So, because this is on YouTube, it's going to presumably become a YouTube video, so we can carry the conversation on, so we can get onto YouTube, onto onto my channel, everyone, and and comment in the comments after after yep. after we're off. Yeah, okay. It'll take that, maybe that's... like two minutes, and then it's rendered, and it'll be on as a static video. If you joined us halfway through, you can watch it from the beginning. And yeah, let's keep the conversation going in the comments because as Roger said, this isn't going to be addressed in an hour. And we're curious what everybody else thinks. You know, should we be focusing on um, skilling up the movement to understand the philosophy of animal rights or perhaps focus on the language and get to it a different way? That's all I got. All right. We'll see everybody in the next show. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye.